first thank you uh, Tom and Blanca for being here and for allowing us to really come into your home and uh, to hear from you today. I want to start with a, a simple question and, and that is uh, just tell us about James. Well James is uh, eight years old and uh, when he was about a year we started having some concerns uh, the way he was responding and, and some behavioral issues and it was an ordeal that lasted what about six months or so of different being referred to we just we thought maybe he had a problem hearing and that led to a referral and various evaluations and finally at about 18 months he was diagnosed uh, with mild autism. Now life with, with autism uh, has got to create some challenges for you as a family with your schedules, your social activities, trying to relate to other families and other parents. Can you speak to us a little bit of, about that? One of the greatest challenges has been um, we have two other daughters as in addition to James and um, just to be able to create a normal life whatever that has meant we've had to redefine normal for our family which has been fun and, and exciting in some ways but really challenging in some other ways you know we've had from the time he was two so the last six years or so has probably been an average of two to three sometimes more therapy sessions per day mm -hmm. uh, some in the home where uh, you know you have the stranger in your home every day uh, you know telling you how to raise your kid and you know we, we've needed that that help and support but it, it, it gets you know it's a struggle. It's also been hard to uh, establish friendships um, with families who do not have children with disabilities because um, James's uniqueness um, it challenges the ability to be able to just go and and go to lunch after church one day, um, or um, go celebrate a friend's birthday, because um, we don't know how he's going to react. Another thing that we deal with is, is you know, the echolalia and the, and the stimming of just movie talk constantly, and uh, sometimes we just wish he would be quiet. Hi, I'm James Siebel. I'm your friendly neighborhood, you know. I only got the bit by spider, you know. I already wanted to be awesome. Could you just share with us a little bit about um, how the stress of, of trying to parent a son with autism has, has had upon your marriage? It has put our marriage on the brink of disaster many times. And it's terrible because, you know, marriage is hard enough. <laughs> I mean, under the best circumstances, it's challenging and you have issues to work through. And then suddenly, in your face, every moment of every day is this gigantic issue that there's no right answers for. The best experts in the field, you know, can't really tell you what you need to do about this, much less family, friends, uh, and, uh, and trying to agree on things trying to, you know, balance, you know, how much do you spend on therapy? How much time do you devote to it? Uh, which therapist do you like? Uh, it, it has been an unbelievable strain on our marriage. It's taken an incredible amount of dedication uh, to stick it out at times. Uh, and it's not because you don't love each other. It's, it's because it's just so hard. And you're tired and frustrated. You're at a loss. Uh, Tom and Blanca, share with us a little bit about your experience in, in um, trying to attend church and include James in church. Nobody ever asked what my story was. You're the first person who has asked what our story has been. There was a period of time uh, at the church that uh, we were dealt maybe the hardest blow of all, uh, of all through this whole journey. Um, you know, James had uh, a lot of behavioral problems, uh, disruptive behavior, particular biting, uh, aggressive behavior, uh, 
and uh, you know we were doing everything we could to, to try to manage the behavior and uh, we were even volunteering in this class to be as one-on-one -on -one. we we would even take turns uh, attending the class with him and trying to you know shadow him around one-on-one -on -one, uh, to, to catch him and uh, I remember one time we, we showed up and uh, the other volunteers weren't there and uh, we, we were there basically just because we were going to try to you know one-on-one -on -one shadow him and the other volunteers didn't show up and we wound up in charge of this class of what 20 25 kids uh, and uh, and at one point there was an incident with another with a little girl and and he uh, and he bit her uh, before we could get to it and we felt terrible and uh, but the next Saturday night after that incident we were called uh, by someone from the church and uh, and told uh, not to bring him to church and uh, this person told us that there were about 10 families that had contacted them and said, if James is there, we're not gonna bring our family anymore. And, uh, I don't know, man, <laughs> that was, was about the low point of my journey. Uh, what, 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 to do, what do you do with that? Uh, you've already lost a lot of the dreams, you know, you've already grieved the child you didn't have. Uh, you know, you dream of, you know, the sports he's gonna play, the, you know, the schools he's gonna go to, the girl he's gonna marry, all of that. And you've kind of given up all that already. And, and uh, then you're just dreaming of being able to manage the behavior and, and function as a family. And you're assuming part of that's gonna be your church. Your church life and and then you feel like that's being taken away from you we were at a crisis and uh, it's like what are we gonna do and uh, I remember just saying you know we, we got to keep going we got to keep going to church and uh, I don't want to make people leave but it's my church and it's my son where we go he goes I was a relatively new Christian. I didn't grow up in the church. I had been a Christian for about 10, 12 years when, when all this happened. But I was excited about God. I was excited about doing ministry for Him. Part of, part of what I thought our plan was going to be was to help out in a church uh, in, in some kind of ministry. Um, and to all of a sudden have the church just not only close the door, but say, your child is not welcome here. It just kind of, your whole world just crumbled. And how do you get up from that? When part of your spiritual strength has come from the body of Christ. That was that was a huge one for me to be able to come to terms with. Um, but uh, but God had a plan for all of this, you know. And there's pain still, you know. There's a little loneliness there that is never going to quite go away, I don't think. Paul tells us in uh, Corinthians that we are to comfort those who are mourning or who are ch being challenged or suffering with the same comfort we've received from God. But it doesn't seem in your experience that you receive that identification, that comfort from the church. Tell us a little bit about how that felt. I think that it would be appropriate when one is grieving the way we were, to just be able to say, we love you. We don't know what to do about this, but you're not alone. And I remember at one point we were talking and 
and I just remember it was like God speaking to me and uh, we finally made the commitment that you know that we were gonna stick it out and uh, and I remember looking at, at my wife and saying I don't understand it but I just sense that somebody's gonna be blessed by how we handle the situation but I know at some point the tide turned a little bit there was a shift in the, the culture of the church the church uh, began to reach out to your family and volunteers began to come and alongside you and your son and eventually a disability ministry was birthed in your church and uh, you guys and your family was was a part of that can you share a little bit about the blessings that that begin to happen and the, the change that began to happen in when the tide began to kind of change a little bit and, and there were signs of hope people stepped forward we didn't even know before that just responded to the need and uh, the kindness of these you know people that were really strangers to us that just all of a sudden were like these angels you know that God sent and uh, and they embraced our son and uh, faithfully came and shadowed him around and, and allowed him to be part of the class and took the pressure off of us so that we could actually sit in church and hear a little bit of the sermon without necessarily just worrying about, oh God, I hope it's not another one of those days. The, uh, the support group meetings, even just as a couple, uh, you know, the volunteers watch the children. And even just as a couple, to have a couple hours without the kids. So to hear some of the other moms and dads share from the heart, a lot of the pretension is gone. Once you have a special needs kid, uh, you get less pretentious because you can't, you can't hide and pretend you're perfect anymore. It's right there. You know, there's just a spiritual depth that's profound that, that, that it's just, you know, when you walk away from something like that, you know that God has been there with you. To see, you know, maybe a couple dozen families there and a couple dozen special needs children running around and uh, to see those parents look like they belong, look like they're having fun, and look like for just those few moments they're not worried about their kids, they're not worried about what anyone's thinking. I think those moments have been the most powerful for me as a parent to see those other parents and, and, and just say, yeah, you're okay here. You're safe. You're safe here. God has been very good to us. We've, we've known some, some pain. We really have known pain. Um, but to, to be able to experience God's, God's blessing in the church, that's from Him. You know? So you know that the pain is, is worth going through, is worth experiencing, because it's something it's about someone greater, and it's about a purpose greater than my dream for my child. It's about God's dream for his children. And he's, he has chosen James to be a part of that. And that, that consoles me, that encourages me, that gives me hope. Is there anything from your heart you'd like to share to a classroom? full of students who are studying disability ministry as they go out and either continue in the ministry they're involved in or look at maybe starting a ministry in their church? The first thing I think is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of our families. Don't be afraid of the kids. Don't be afraid of the adults who might be. Um, they're still people and they still need the love. They still need the support. They, they still need to be heard. Um, and then the other thing would be take one family at a time, you know. Um, we live in a society, and, and even the church has suffered from this, that we just want to grow things so quickly. Um, so it's all about the numbers. Yeah. And, and I think that, especially within disability ministry, you have the opportunity to, to really touch the life um, and the hearts of, of a family who who is 
wanting to to just be understood and heard. Thank you again, Tom and Blanca, for allowing us to come in and to your lives and to your home today and hear from you. God bless you.